It feels really awkward to introduce myself to a room of people 80% of you know who I am <laughs> and grew up with me. But for those of you who don't know me, I'm Kate Dolan Leach. I wrote a novel called Dead Letters. Um, it's set here in the Finger Lakes. And it's the story of a very dysfunctional family. There are two twins in this family, identical twin sisters, Ava and Zelda. And one of them thinks she has managed to escape from her horrible fucked up family and move to Paris. Um, until she gets an email from her mother telling her that her twin sister has burned to death in a barn fire. <laughs> and she afterwards feels compelled to go home and find out what really happened, because she doesn't really believe that that's what really happened. Um, you find all that out in the first like five or ten pages, so I haven't ruined too much plot. I'm going to read just the first couple of pages because of spoiler stuff and because these are some of my favorite pages of the book. They just sort of appeared one day as I was writing a different project and I ended up working on this book until it became a 350 odd page creation. So <laughs> these are still some of my favorite pages and they're also uh, unusually dense for the word games that appear in the books. Some of you know there are uh, 26 pangrams in the book that's sentences that contain all 26 letters of the alphabet. Um, so I think I'll read through one of those, at least. You can listen for it. And there are a couple of other little alphabetical clues in the first few paragraphs. So. Chapter 1. A born creator of myths, my sister always liked to tell the story of how we were misnamed. She was proud of it, as though she, as a tiny blue infant, had bent kismet to her will and appropriated the name that was supposed to be mine. My parents were trying to be clever, before they lost the ability to be anything other than utterly miserable, and our names were meant to be part of our self-constructed, quirky family mythology, A to Z, Ava, and Zelda. The firstborn would be A for Ava, and the secondborn would be Z for Zelda, and together we would be the whole alphabet for my deluded and briefly optimistic parents, both of whom were located unimpressively in the middle, M for Marlon and N for Nadine. My father was himself named for a film star, and with his usual short-sighted narcissism, he sought to create some sort of large looming legacy for his burgeoning small family. Burgeon, we would not. Born second, I was destined for the end of the alphabet. But my sister was Zelda from her first screaming breath, wild and indomitable until her final immolation. A careless nurse handed my father the babies in the wrong order, so that his second born was indelicately plopped into his arms first, and I was christened Ava. I say christened purely as a casual description. My mother would have thoroughly lost her shit had any question of formal baptism been raised. My parents were good pagans, even if they weren't much good at anything else. Clearly delighted with this strange twist, my father insisted that we keep our misnomers. He said that the family Antipova would turn even the alphabet on its head. My mother, predictably, lay surly and despairing in her bed, counting down the seconds until her first gin and tonic in eight months. Even now, I can't really blame her. The seatbelt light dings, and I unbuckle in order to root around in my ba bag for my iPad. I've read the emails so many times I have it memorized, but I still feel a compulsion to stare at the words on the shimmering screen. To little a at gmail.com from noconnor at gmail.com. June 21st, 2016 at 3.04 a.m. Ava, honestly, the whole point of you having a cell phone is so that I can call you in an emergency, which this is. If you'd pick up your goddamn phone, I wouldn't have to tell you by email that your sister is dead. There was some type of fire following one of your sister's drunken binges, and apparently she didn't make it out. If you leave Paris tomorrow, you might make it in time for the service. I can't really tell whether the misspellings are because A, mom is drunk, B, she never really learned to type, I'm not a fucking secretary, I didn't become a feminist so I could end up tapping out correspondence, or C, the dementia is affecting her orthography. My money's on all three. I've never seen Nadine Antipova, nay O'Connor, greet any kind of news, either good or bad, without a quart of gin in the wings. The death of a daughter, especially that of her preferred daughter, has probably rattled even her. My guess is that she was already three sheets to the wind when they told her, and she wasn't able to get through to me on my cell phone because she either couldn't remember the number or misdialed it. She would have had to toddle upstairs to the decrepit old mat book, gathering dust on what used to be my father's desk. 
She would have lowered herself into the rickety office chair and squinted at the glare of the screen. After several frustrating minutes and false starts, and probably another slug of gin, she would have located Firefox and found her way to Gmail if she didn't try her old and defunct Hotmail account first. She probably would have sworn viciously at the screen when asked for her password. Nadine would consider the computer's request for her to remember a specific detail as personally malicious, a couched taunt regarding her slipping faculties. She would have tried to type something in, and the password would have been pre-populated, because Zelda had, in her own inconsistent and careless way, tried to make our mother's grim life a little easier. And then, drunk, aggravated, angry, and frightened, my mother wrote me a bitchy email to tell me that my twin sister had burned to death. And if that's how she told me, I can only imagine how my father found out. My first thought on reading the letter was that Zelda would have appreciated that death. This was exactly how she would have chosen it. It was a fitting end for someone named after Mrs. Fitzgerald, who died, raving, when a fire destroyed the sanatorium where she had been locked away for a good chunk of her life. How Bertha Rochester dies in rather similar circumstances. As children, we played Joan of Arc, and Zelda built elaborate pyres for straw dolls decorated as the teenage martyr. Zelda was Joan. I was always cast as the nefarious English inquisitors. Death by fire was the right death for visionaries and madwomen, and Zelda was both, my dark double. But then, because I know my sister, I read between the lines. So I think I'll just open it up for questions, and we could talk about this book or any books or literature in general if you guys would like and then drink some wine first novel it's the first one that i've published it's not the first one i've written i wrote the first one and i was i think 10 years old it was not very good (laughs) do you have favorite authors that influenced you yeah so for this book in particular uh the biggest influences are edgar Allan poe and uh a french literary movement called the ulipo who believed in constrained writing. So basically their philosophy is that the more constrained your writing is, the more creative you're forced to be. So things like sentences that contain every single letter of the alphabet are very much something that they are invested in. Uh, A very famous writer in this uh, literary movement wrote a book that doesn't contain the letter E. And it gets translated in English. The title is called Avoid. Um, And so they play all sorts of literary games like that. So I was very interested in what writing would be like if I had to write in a very specific genre. And I was writing in the Gothic and writing in detective fiction, which is Poe's contribution to to literature. And um, I also wanted to see what that would force me to do creatively um, as thinking about the Ulipo. There are plenty of other influences in there, too. <laughs> but those are the two main ones, and that's who the, the, the two little sentences at the beginning of the book are, are attributed to. How did growing up in this area influence your writing? Well, so yeah, it's obviously set on the Finger Lakes. It's on Seneca Lake. It's a vineyard over there. I grew up in Hector, the county where this takes place, probably seven or eight miles from where the fictitious vineyard is supposed to be. Um, and I moved away when I was 17 and was living overseas and have been for most of the last 10 or 12 years. Um, and so I think I was thinking about home a lot, as you do when you move away young and sort of, you know, fantasize about summers in the Finger Lakes. And this is a novel set in summer in the Finger Lakes. Just, um, so that experience of leaving and coming home, uh, was very familiar, and I knew that I kind of wanted to start an early scene where she's on the plane on the way back home and thinking about what that means and what it's going to feel like when you get home. How long did it take you to write that whole novel? So I drafted it really quickly and then had to spend the better part of a year revising. So it took about two, maybe three months of drafting, and then I revised for about a year, and then I had to do more revisions once I got an agent, and then I had to do more revisions once I got an editor, and then I had to do more revisions once I got a copy editor, and then I had to go over the proofs. Um, so the whole process probably took about two years and a bit of change um, from sitting down to start it and publication. Longer than that, two and a half years, I would say. Publication is slow. The book was acquired a year and a half ago, so most of it's just been a lot of emails back and forth. Roger. What did you use? I mean, it's a uh, fiction, but as far as fact checking, I mean, if it was a fire in Hector, Watkins Glen, and the respondent would have been the Hector Police Fire Department. 
<laughs> this is true, except that there's a suspected, there's foul play suspected, so the yeah, police the department gets involved. Was, there, was, there was an investigation there. Watkins Glen didn't have jurisdiction over the town of Hector when the sheriff. I, I guess I should have fact checked with my family member who was involved in local judicial politics for the better part of 40 years. Probably would have been worth a phone call to, I don't know, <laughs> Judge Rector. <laughs> Noted. I did my research on the wine, though. That is very thoroughly fact-checked. <laughs> you won't find a wrong tasting note in this book. <laughs> um, a note on that, though. I had an amazing copy editor, and the sorts of fact-checking that she did specifically just, you know, I would say around 10 miles when I was describing the distance between Watkins Glen and Stone Cat, and she would be Google Mapsing it and being like, it's actually 13.1. Do we feel like we need to reflect that in the vocabulary? I'm like, oh. I don't think so, but okay. Um, and sh the dates changed in the book uh, two or three times. Uh, it became a different year, and one year was a leap year, and the other one wasn't. So all the weekdays had to be changed. <sighs> and I'm not good at that sort of thing. Uh, and I had this amazing copy editor who was just clearly a different kind of reader than I am, but also different to anyone I know in the way that she just goes through and the things that she thinks of to double check are just, like I think in one scene they're leaving two goats at 10.15 and it's a Wednesday evening and she double checked and found out that two goats actually closes at 9 p.m. on Wednesdays um, in the summer and do we need to move the timeline up an hour, which actually had like a cascading ripple effect that was like, I just remember getting this email in a cafe in Paris and putting my head in my hands, and like, oh, what have I done? <laughs> um, but I think she caught everything, so other other than the jurisdictional <laughs> shortcomings. Were all the wines uh, legitimate names of wines? Most of them are, yeah. Um, I don't name too many local vineyards um, by name, but well, there are... You did Dr. Frank, you avoided naming Dr. I, I think I just allude to Dr. Frank. There's a California wine, The Prisoner, that I refer to specifically because it's a plot detail. Um, and then some of them get, get named specifically. But I tend to stick to a, a regional thing. How did you come up with the cover? So the cover is not my jurisdiction, as it turns out. Uh, the, there's a whole art department at Random House that is in charge of designing covers. <laughs> Uh, and we'd talked back and forth, and they asked for my input early on, and we were thinking something typographical that would have, you know, letters of the alphabet, something clever, some sort of, like, Scrabble or crossword type thing. Uh, and then they just, out of the blue one day, emailed me this. <laughs> and I took one look at it. I was like, absolutely not. No, it looks like cheap erotic fiction, like people are going to think I write chick lit, and, like, whose legs are those? And... Um, it, you know, the, the photoshopping looks weird, and is that even a painting, or is it a, like, picture? Um, but then everybody really loved it at Random House, and they kind of, like, kept pushing me and kept pushing me. And then finally one day I looked at it, and I thought, actually, that really, it, it really does suit it, doesn't it? Um, and, yeah, sex sells, absolutely. <laughs> if, it, if it moves more covers, uh, copies off the shelves. I'll, I'll live with that. Pick your battles. <laughs> exactly. I got my title in exchange. So. I noticed it lists in there that there's an audio version of this. Is that it's? It's out. Who's the reader in that? Her name is Georgina Marie, and she's a an actress who does audiobooks. Um, and she narrates the whole damn thing. They gave me a choice between two, so they let me listen to the auditions for two different actors, and I just liked one of them a little bit more than the other, and that's who they went with. So, hooray! I can't listen to it anymore because I'm really sick of this book. <laughs> Young keeps wanting to listen to it in the car. We've got the CDs like in the in the center console, and I did the first 15 minutes and said, "Okay, yeah, it sounds good. She does a good she does a good job. She does Zelda differently from Ava. I'm happy. That's all I need to know." How many hours is the book? I think lots. 14, 14 15. Wow. Is there an abridged or unabridged? Unabridged. Oh. It's a good long haul flight of listening. You could fly all the way to South Africa. Have you done a glossary of like all the hidden things that are in the novel that will be available or clues or other than you got to be smart and figure it out yourself? Afraid so. I have a glossary for myself and for my translators. I had to send 
you know, because if you're translating this book into a different language and you don't know which sentences are supposed to have all the letters of the alphabet, you know, they're going to accidentally just not do that. And I think my poor German translators, I think, hate me. But <laughs> you get more words in German, so they probably were okay with uh, cramming all the, all the letters in. Um, but there's a, there's, a, there's a Word document. It won't be published. Mm -hmm. In the back there. You, when you talk about stone cat mm -hmm. or two goats or kuma charmers, did you have to get their permission to? No one really raised their eyebrows. Everyone who worked on the editing was aware that they're real places. Obviously, my copy editor was on the internet. Um, in an early draft, I referred to the bar at Stone Cat, I think, as Oak. And she sent me an email saying, I looked at pictures on the internet, and there are none that are specifically of the bar. But just what I'm able to see from the photograph they have, it's a little too finely grained to be Oak, in my opinion. <laughs> But I can't find any, like, I can't find any real information either way. Uh, can you confirm or, or just, you know, make sure that that's correct? I was like, okay, um, I think I sent mom to Stone Cat. I was going to send you. You just ended up bumping into someone from Stone Cat at Not My Dad's. Yeah, T-Berg. Um, and it is not, in fact, oak. It turns out it is cherry. I forgot now. It's cherry, and it's the twin piece of a bar at the Rongo. So they split a piece of wood in half, and half of it is at the Rongo, and half is at Stone Cat, um, which I really liked, which turned out to be like better than the fiction I had produced. Um, so yeah, little, little twins. Um, and the Rongo will probably be in the next book, so it's perfect. Just. Mm. You get nervous at all about people who do not know you, kind of seeing your with your family. I don't, but I think they might. <laughs> I didn't really worry about it because it was like it was so obvious to me that I was writing fiction. It was like I just didn't really ever question that. Emily was one of my second or third readers, my sister, for yeah. those of you who don't know. Um, and it didn't even occur to me to like preface it with something. And after she read it, she was like, just to be clear, this isn't about us, right? <laughs> I was like, no. She's like, yeah, I didn't think so. You should tell mom, though, because she's not going to like it. <laughs> um, uh, so, you know, when I'm meeting people, one of the questions I often get asked is, is there any autobiographical stuff in there? And I say, well, it's set in the Finger Lakes where I grew up. That's pretty autobiographical, and, you know. What is your role in selling the book? So in terms of like, these readings, are you here because this is your home? And you came to do this, or are you doing this all over you know, the country? And so really, they have me doing these sorts of things just as a way to give people a chance to talk to authors and get people in the same room talking about books. Um, I, don't, I think everyone has sort of acknowledged that sending authors on tours doesn't really sell books. It's just nice for people to feel like they can have a connection with an author, however briefly. Um, and I did this one because I've been coming to this bookstore since I was three or four years old, and I love it here. So. So far, it's going into German, Polish, Brazilian Portuguese, actually, and then just the UK, so British English. I don't know if that counts as a fourth. <laughs> um, and that's, that's it so far. See? You said you didn't want the book to be chiclet. You say what you wanted it to be? Yeah, it's a tough question. I think I pitched it when I was pitching it to agents. Um, I definitely stuck pretty closely to the thriller mystery genre, um, which are often pretty male dominated, so pretty far from the chiclet spectrum. Um, but I always knew that it was a, like a little bit too literary fiction to get away with that entirely. Um, and then I found out that I'd committed myself to being in a genre after I'd done that, and my agent proceeded to just like keep it and pitched it to publishers in the same way. So it's it's still in a sort of thriller suspense. You know, that's the part of the bookstore that it goes in now. Um, and I'm okay with that. I like that, actually. It's cross-listed as women's fiction, which any book written by an author with a female protagonist gets cross-listed as women's fiction. I think the publishing industry tends to really paint any female author, any female character with these very broad strokes. She's female, she must have women's issues stuff. Um, I'm, not, I'm not even sure what that means. <laughs> so, Joel. You were talking about your next book, mm -hmm. and you appear to me to be full of energy and, and you know, lots of ideas, and 
the only stories about writers that come to mind for me are the Cheyenne and Barton Fink. But um, do you struggle with writer's block? With the creative process. Oh, I probably shouldn't say no because that's a jinx, right? So far, it's been okay. I had already written some of the beginning of the next book when this one was acquired. So I already had a sense of what the next one, what I wanted it to be. Um, it's been a little bit harder to find time to work on it in the last year just because if you're going back and forth between two stories, it gets, it's very easy to let things bleed over into each other and it's hard not to bring the baggage of this book into the next book. So I've, I'm having a harder time with the second one just because of timing and momentum, I think. Uh, and hopefully that's not indicative of writer's block. It's just being yeah. a little bit busier than I was when I was working on this. You know, in the first book, I'm assuming that you know you're going through your life and you're filming that movie. You're seeing. Do you still do that? You know, as you're, you're you've got this new book in process. Mm -hmm. Every experience you have kind of goes into your head. Of, oh, I file this one away as a possible character scene. I, I think, yeah, I think it's really easy to do that. <laughs> I have one Facebook friend. I'm still friends with him just because I keep thinking, man, it would be a fabulous character. <laughs> like, he's crazy, but I, I, think, I think I need to just like keep my finger on that particular pulse because, boy, that's, that's gold. It's novel gold. <laughs> Um, yeah, that happens. We're, we're horrible vampires, us writer people, I think. <laughs> do, you, do you know what it's like when an old man is reading a book by some an author who was uh, in diapers when you first met him? <laughs> you know the answer is no. <laughs> and they're talking about all these sexual exploits. <laughs> I can only imagine. In words, in words that you didn't expect to be coming from the author's mouth. Yeah. I have read a lot of novels written by old men who are like confronted with young female sexuality and yeah, I know it makes them a little uncomfortable. <laughs> Any other questions? Talk a little more about, you, you described the experience of this book. Do characters arise and get over a period of days or weeks? Do you feel like it's something that's been sitting there and you discovered it, it walked in your door, or the plot arose, or the, the wordplay element? What? And, you know, it's like so many authors get asked this, and everyone has just like a totally different answer. And I don't know that I've got a very good answer to the where do ideas come from question. Um, for this book, in particular, it was the characters. Ava and Zelda, I could just hear them talking to each other. And, like, they both wouldn't shut up, and they were driving me nuts. And, the like, the first ten pages are, you know, they've been edited and tweaked, but they're pretty much unchanged from what I wrote in a single morning of writing. Um, almost the whole first chapter was just, like, sitting down and being like, right, okay, you two zip it. <laughs> um, and then they just kept talking to each other. And the voices were just very, very loud and insistent. Um, particularly Zelda's, I think. And Ava was just getting dragged along like the rest of us. And, uh, and like myself. And Zelda just kept insisting that I do little things and uh, find the next clue. And I got sucked in about as quickly as Ava does. <laughs> Could you talk a little bit about how you found the publisher? Yeah. Publishing's sort of like playing a lottery. It doesn't usually go very well. Uh, certainly that was my experience for my first book. Um, but the rough process is that you send an email to agents, uh, a dozen, maybe 20 agents that you really like and whose work you really like and you have to research them and it takes forever. Um, and they get about 100 of those emails a day. Um, and hopefully they read your email and like it and ask to read your book which doesn't always happen, but in this case did. And then uh, I ended up with, I think, seven agents who wanted to represent me, which was a nice change of pace from the previous experience where I'd had none, who in the end actually really wanted to, to rep the book. Um, so I got to choose, which was really nice. And then once you have an agent, you do some revisions, you work on the manuscript for a little while until everybody's happy with it. And then the agent takes it to a publishing house, uh, or usually 10 or so publishing houses. 
uh, and shops the manuscript around to different editors there, specific editors. Um, and it's very similar to the process of getting an agent at that point, where they're you know, getting a little slim packet with a few pages and a letter saying what the book is about. Uh, and then they decide if they want to read on, and then if they like it, you enter up in, in further conversation. Um, so I did that, and uh, my book actually ended up going to auction, which meant that there were a number of publishing houses that wanted it. Um, and I was really lucky that my very favorite one, who was the editor at Random House, preempted the book, which means she just called an end to the auction um, and, and bought the book and the next one. So it's kind of... It's kind of a fairy tale publishing story. It doesn't usually happen that way. So um, it was it, it was a very thank you. It was, it was smoother than I had any right to expect that it would be. Have you ever considered work creating things that are shorter in the way that you create them? I try and they inevitably end up longer. Wow. Every time I write a short story it ends up being eighty five pages long. Um, yeah. I, I just don't seem to have I should say that I don't even love reading short stories that much. I just like really long novels. Um, I don't even write the length of novels that I prefer to read, which is 800 pages plus. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, I think obviously you should try to do all the things that are hard for you as a writer. And I'll get around to it at some point, but <laughs> maybe it would, it would be a huge constraint for me. I mean, it would be almost crippling, I think, at this particular stage. Um, but I should, you're right, I should try it. What were the specific things about Edgar Allan Poe that influenced your writing style? Probably the largest contributing thing is detective fiction. Um, so this, I do think of it as detective fiction, even if the detective is a little bit... Not, not the Sherlock Holmes that we've come to expect uh, since Edgar Allan Poe invented uh, what we now know to be detective fiction with a detective who follows a series of logical clues to a rational conclusion that was in plain sight for someone brilliant enough to catch on to it from the very beginning. So he wrote three short stories in the 1840s that basically invented this genre. Um, and they're kind of clunky. They're not like narratively a lot of fun. They're more focused on the form. They're a little bit hokey, um, and Poe himself can be a little bit hokey, but I've, I liked, I liked that inception of detective fiction, and I also like the hokey gothic fiction too. I like the Raven. I like the heavy-handed little tales about, you know, hearts beating out of floors and stuff. Um, and, you know, this was not a subtle book. Um, <laughs> there is, you know, the clues are very, they're, they're stolen from genre fiction. The darkness is a little bit over the top in a lot of places. Um, I play with repetition in a very manipulative way in the same way that Poe does. Um, so I, I like to think I borrowed some of his good stuff and then also got some of his bad habits <laughs> too. Um, a contribution to, to gothic fiction in any case at the very least. Are there How did your education influence your writing style? Not at all. <laughs> um, yeah, I studied politics and languages. Um, so I really, I didn't ever take English classes. I didn't, never taken a creative fiction class. Got no background in this. Um, it just goes to show you, you never know. You never know. <laughs> I, I, maybe it would have totally ruined my love. I, was, I think that's why I'd never decided to major in English, for example. I was worried it would murder my love of reading books in bed, and that wasn't going to be worth it for me. <laughs> when the book gets translated mm. into German, are they going to preserve the translation? They did. They did. Um, I sent... I sent all of my translators uh, a little packet with all the things, you know, because I've translated books. I know exactly which places are going to be especially annoying. I mean, most of it's going to be pretty annoying, um, to be fair. But there are a couple of things that I thought they should know about. Um, and the Germans are the only one who have actually finished translating. Um, and it's coming out in June, and they said they kept the pangrams, and... Maybe I'll have you two look over the German manuscript because I will have no idea whether or not they did. <laughs> um, I'm pretty excited about it. I actually really like the German cover. 
I'm hoping I can finagle an invitation to Berlin <laughs> to meet my team. We'll see. Um, I don't see it as a movie. Who knows? I'd love to see it. Um, it's out in L.A. with some producers, but getting a movie made is, again, I like the lottery. So we'll see. Um, so my agency has an L.A. office, and part of what they do is they send manuscripts for the people they represent around to producers in L.A. So. I mean, they do that for most of the books they have, so it's hard to say whether that means anything and when or if ever it will happen, but I suppose it's not impossible. It's, it's next to impossible. <laughs>